I want to do a little extension on the work that we did with reacting masses, and now look at a concept called limiting reactants. To do that, I want to begin with a little bit of an analogy. Consider you're making a test, and you have one test paper. The teacher would also require that you have access to one periodic table, and three sheets of full scalp. Those are all stapled together and placed on your desk to form one complete test. My question is, if we're given these numbers of the various items, 34 test questions, 31 periodic tables, and 87 sheets of full scap, how many complete tests could I make? I want to show you an approach to this that we can take to chemistry. So the making of a test is much like a chemical equation. And what I'm going to do now is take each of these items and predict how many tests they could make. So 34 test questions could, in theory, make 34 complete tests. If I consider the periodic tables, they also have a one-to-one -one ratio, one periodic table for one complete test. I could make 31 complete tests. And with 87 sheets of full scap or answer papers being a three-to-one ratio, I could make 29 complete tests. The rule is you can only make the smaller of those amounts because you'll run out of that particular item. So 29 tests is the maximum number of tests I could make. Which item did I run out of first? Well, in this particular case, the 29 tests was limited by the answer papers. I call that my limiting item. And the other two are my excess items. I have extra of those. How many extra items do I have? Well, focusing just on my limiting item for now, 87 answer papers would require 29 periodic tables because there's a 3 to 1 ratio between the two of them. Being that I'm given 31, but I require 29, there would be two left over. Similarly, there's one periodic table for every test question in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I require 29 periodic tables, I also would require 29 test questions, leaving me five extra. So this approach that I used here, I'm going to also use in my chemical examples. Let's look at the steps that are involved. I begin with a chemical equation and a certain mass, a mass of A and a mass of B. This is different than what we did before because in previous examples we were only given one starting mass, not both. And I'm asked to figure out what mass of C I'll produce. So much like in the other method, I begin by ensuring that my chemical equation is balanced. I'm going to convert the masses to moles. So starting with substance A, I convert that to moles of A using the molar mass of A. Using the stoichiometric coefficients in the equation, I determine the ratio and the moles of C that I would produce. Now here's where the new step occurs. I have to repeat this for each of the substances of which I know their mass. So I'm going to take substance B and do exactly the same. Convert it to moles of B using the molar mass and then using the 1 to 2 ratio, determine the moles of C that I would produce. So at this point, I would have two moles of C. The smallest one is the amount that I actually make. That's my limiting chemical, and that's the one I need to focus on because that's going to determine how much product I make. So I can then determine the amount of C that I would make by ignoring the information about my excess reaction and just focusing on my limiting reagent. So let's put this in a chemical example. Under laboratory conditions, I want to recover iron from iron oxide. And I have 15.6 grams of the iron oxide and 3.6 grams of carbon all mixed together. The chemical equation you see here below. And I want to identify which of these is my limiting reactant, magnesium uh, iron oxide or the carbon. I begin with my iron oxide. I'll convert that information to moles using the molar mass of iron oxide. The ratio that exists between iron oxide and iron, the substance I want to make, is 2 to 4, and I can simplify that ratio to 1 to 2. So I'm going to double the moles and arrive at this. So that's how many moles of iron I could make based on my iron oxide. I now repeat that calculation, but begin with the carbon. Convert the carbon to moles using the molar mass of carbon. The ratio that exists between carbon and iron is 3 to 4, so I'm going to multiply 0 0.316 by 4 and divide by 3. I only make the smaller of those two amounts. That then indicates that iron oxide is my limiting reagent 
and the carbon would be my excess reagent. Let's continue on and determine how much iron would I actually make. So much like in my analogy, I ignore the information about my excess reagent and just focus on my limiting reagent information. So using that number of moles of iron, I convert that to mass using the molar mass of iron, and I arrive at 10.9 grams of iron. Finally, I want to determine the amount and mass of my excess reagent or excess reactant. So again, I have the information here for my limiting reagent, converting the 15.6 grams into moles. The ratio that exists between my limiting reagent and my excess reagent is 2 to 3. Hence, 0.146 moles would be required. How much am I actually given? Well, I have 3.8 grams, and I divide that by the molar mass of carbon, and I'm actually given 3.316 moles. Again, I require 0.146. I subtract those, and that gives me my mass, or my amount, of excess reagent. If I wish to convert that into a mass, I use the molar mass of carbon, and I come up with about 2 grams. Again, I'm matching significant digits with a 3.8. So questions are always welcome. Thanks again for watching.